here with some smelly things today because there is a process that the body does called olfactory fatigue. And what that is, is when you are around something with a strong smell like an onion or coffee beans, ground turmeric or, or an air freshener, what happens is when that smell is constant and always there, eventually your body stops recording it. It stops sending signals to the brain. It assumes that the brain already knows that smell there and there's no point keep telling you. So you can be someone with a really strong smell, but after a while you stop noticing it. And it's this process of being so used to something that we stop noticing it that we talked about last week and I want to talk about again this week. We are working through the book of Colossians, a book in the New Testament, and we're taking a section at a time and just asking what does God want to say to us? What jumps out at us and what catches our attention? And last week we talked about the good news. This was the basis for everything that Paul was doing. This is what the basis for his encouragement to the church in Colossae. And it, we talked about the good news that we can become so used to it, it can become such background in our lives, what God has done, that we can almost forget it's there. And I kind of want to talk about the same thing this week. We are doing the next section of the book and it is chapter one of Colossians, verses 15 to 23. And I'm just going to read out actually the first five verses, because it starts with a poem. Paul, who writes this, is well versed in the, the Old Testament's way of using poetry to express something about God. And he starts with this. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as the thrones, kingdoms, rulers and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else and he holds all cre creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is first in everything. For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ and through him God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. One of the biggest controversies in the church throughout its history has been exactly what was the nature of Jesus. And this has been a really hard thing for people to work out because basically it's shocking. And I guess today what I want to talk about is we have lost the idea of that shock. We have become so used to these concepts, these ideas that we don't think about them anymore and we don't allow ourselves to be shocked by it. But throughout history, people have really struggled to understand the nature of Jesus, the idea of him being God and the idea of him being human, to be fully those two things. And this is what Paul starts with. He starts with this poem because he's telling the Colossians we need to be centered around and worship Jesus. And you don't do that by just telling someone you've got to worship Jesus. What Paul does is he writes this amazing poem to talk about just how wonderful Jesus is. What he wants to do is open up the eyes of the believers in Colossae to just see the awesome magnitude of Jesus so that they will begin to worship. And he tackles this issue about the nature of Christ because he talks about Jesus as being existing before creation, as being the agent of creation, the, the, the person who created the whole universe, the seen and the unseen elements of the universe, the heavenly realms and the, and the earthly realms. He is the source of creation and he is the destination of creation. It's all created for him, for his pleasure, for his enjoyment, for his glory. All this is going on, but then Paul winds this down as well to the point where Jesus would die on the cross to become a mortal human being. Now people have always struggled with this because 
they don't like the idea. It is a shocking idea. And the shock is, how could God become human? How could God, who is supreme and transcendent and different and awesome, become part of this material creation? And people have really struggled with that. And so they kind of ended up as one way. They can say, well, there is no way that God could have been part of the mess of this physical universe. There's no way we can have a God who went to the toilet, who got tired, who uh, had emotions, who suffered. So what they say is, well, Jesus wasn't really God. There was this human being walking around who was a very special human being, but he wasn't God. Or they say, well, he was some kind of like lesser God. He wasn't quite human, but he wasn't fully God at the same time. Or they say, well, yeah, God came, but God wasn't properly human. That wouldn't work. So Jesus was like some kind of hologram or some kind of avatar of God. It was fully God, but kind of in disguise, pretending to be a human. But what Paul wants to say is Jesus was fully God and fully human. And he arrives at that not by saying, well, you've kind of got the amazingness of God at this end and then you've got the mess of the physical universe and humans at this end. And so let's just do a compromise. And Jesus was somewhere in the middle. Then what Paul does is he pushes it to the two extremes and he says, yeah, he was God and he created everything, everything you see and and." everything you can't see and the spiritual world and the physical world, he created all that and it was a pouring out from him for his, for him as well. So he pushes that extreme and then he pushes to the other extreme. He said, and he came as a human being and he died this most shameful death on the cross, this, this death of a criminal on the cross, full of shame. He pushes him to the both extremes and he says, But the reality is not trying to compromise, not trying to bring these two ideas together, but to be jarred by the fact that these are two contradictory ideas that exist in Jesus. That's how amazing and wonderful it is. Now, I think we just tend to not think about this. We don't think about the wonder of this. We've become kind of overused to the the things we say about Jesus being God and Jesus being human, and we don't think about it. But this thinking does exist in us. So for some of us, we lean towards the divine nature of Jesus and we feel that he is unapproachable. And when we think about the mess in our lives, we become ashamed and we want to hold back from Jesus because we think, no, you don't want to be involved with all this mess. And so we go too far that way or we go too far the other way. And we we kind of think about Jesus is just human and he becomes our buddy. And yeah, Jesus, yeah, he's just my pal. And, you know, we do stuff together and we lose all sense of the awesome creator of the universe. So one question we need to ask ourselves is, what do we think of Jesus? Do we comprehend? Are we trying to stretch our minds? Are we being shocked by the fact that Jesus is this amazing, awesome, terrifying creator of the universe and at the same time this human being who experienced life like we did to the point of suffering on our behalf and the question i specifically want us to wrestle with today is this idea of jesus being supreme over everything to be supreme over all of creation and to be supreme over all of human life. The passage in my Bible is entitled The Supremacy of Christ and this is the spiritual reality of the universe. This is the truth. Jesus is supreme over everything and yet he has given us free will to choose what is supreme in our lives. You see Jesus can't be supreme if anything else has the place of supremacy. So if we think to ourselves, yeah, God, you can be in charge of all my life, except for this little bit, Jesus isn't supreme. Because there's this this little bit that he doesn't have supremacy over. So if we can say, God, you can have, do anything you want to in my life, except I don't want you to touch my relationships, or except I don't want to have my career come under you, except I don't want, this element of my finances to be in your control, except I don't want to bring this way of thinking I have, except I don't want to bring this habit into you. 
then Jesus isn't supreme in our lives. And if we are thinking, you know, I have this arrangement with God, he's in charge of my life, but there's this little area and Jesus, my buddy, he understands, he's fine with it. It's not the Jesus in the Bible. It's not the Jesus that Paul is talking about to us. You know, we might have stuff in our lives that we struggle with, stuff that we know that God probably isn't on board with, but we are trying to uh, convince ourselves that he's fine, he'll turn a blind eye to it. Jesus does understand. Jesus doesn't want us to be ashamed. Jesus doesn't want us to try and hide anything. And he's on our side and he lovingly accepts us. But what he's saying to us is, make me supreme in your life. Make me supreme over that area. And I will do something in that area of your life that you couldn't believe. I will set you free. I will reshape your life so that you can become the person I created you to be. So you can become like me. But while anything else is supreme in our lives, we're not even allowing Jesus to do that. I'm sure you have areas, I have areas of my life where painfully I had to say, God, you can be in control of this. And sometimes it meant making changes, making decisions. Sometimes it meant involving others so they could support me and check in on me. Sometimes it meant, you know, getting rid of something or doing something else, whatever it is, if we have an area of our life that we are not allowing Jesus to be supreme over, we have somehow stopped worshipping the God of the universe and we're, we're creating a God, we're trying to create a God of our own invention. So this is the challenge I want to leave you with today. I, I suggest, you, why don't you read this passage for yourself? Why don't you meditate on it? Why don't you think, God, have I given you permission over everything of my life? And it is a terrifying thought, isn't it? Because what would happen? If we give God permission, what would happen? We're back to how secure are we that God loves us and that he wants to do good in our lives. And we need to wrestle with that. And we need to take that first step. I don't think it means that we're going to have to sell everything we own and move to a place we would hate. But maybe it means starting allowing God to reshape our attitudes and priorities. So let's pray. Jesus, you are supreme over everything in the universe. It was created by you and for you. You are the start and the end. Everything finds its place and its purpose and its belonging in how you created it to be, Lord. And you sustain it even now. And you did this by dying on the cross, by reconciling the brokenness of this universe to your wonderful perfection. You brought it together and you invite us into that story, into that adventure. Lord, and in the same way, there are things in our lives that we need to allow to die so that you can resurrect something different out of it. Lord, speak to us. Just bring to our minds those items, things, areas, attitudes, priorities in our life that we haven't given you permission over. We haven't made you supreme. Lord, and just show us what is that first step to start to give you permission, to give you supremacy. In Jesus' name, Amen. Thank you.